Nathan S. Cultural Hero. The first speaker is Dr. Eliezer Papo. Uh, Dr. Eliezer Papo is Senior Lecturer in the Hebrew Literature Department at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and he is also the Chairman of the Moshe David Gaon Center for Ladinov Culture at the same university. His research centers on oral literature in general and Sephardic literature, oral written, rabbinic and secular, in particular. In January 2014, his book, And Those Shall Just With Your Son, Judeo-Spanish Parodies on the Passover and mm -hmm. received the prestigious Ben Zvi Award. Dr. Papo is also a representative of the Israeli Academia in the Council of the National Authority for Latino Culture, serving also as a member of its executive board. He has published many articles about different aspects of Sephardic culture and literature, as well as four works of fiction, one in Ladino and three in Serbo Croatian. His recent publications include Meliselda and its symbolism from Shabbatai Tzvi's His Inner Circle and His Later Followers, Kabbalah, Journal for the, in Kabbalah, Journal for the Study of Jewish Mystical Texts, The Last Supper and Gneževa Večera, Powerless and Their Resonances in Traditional Christian and Serbian Folk Culture, in Slavic and East European Journal, From Lucrezia to Don Kreshensha, Don, Cre Don Crencia. I don't care. <laughs> Lesser here. To Don Crencia, or sorry, I just had to convert the Caracal Sabatian ecotype of medieval romance and its theological significance in Journal of Jewish Thought and Philosophy. Of course, Dr. Papo is one of the organizers of this wonderful conference, and his topic here is. N uh, Nathan, between oral legends and written hagiography, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, so what we have right here is Jewish National Calendar published uh, in 1937-38 and there is an article of Jacques Confino uh, which is... Oh, microphone, exactly. There is an article there by uh, a famous Sephardic writer from Serbia, Jacques Confino, uh, called At the Grave of the Prophet Nathan. And in that article he basically describes his visit, his one day visit to Skopje, where a local Macedonian Sephardic Jew, Bahar, took him and showed him uh, Nathan's grave. So this is important for us because of few facts. First of all, this is the most accurate description we have by now, uh, where the grave stood exactly, and also because it includes certain uh, description of costumes and legends of Macedonian Jews related to Nathan's grave. So basically he says that, gro that the Jewish cemetery is uh, located on next to the village Donje Vodno, This is exactly where we will go today uh, afternoon. Uh, he says, in 37, he says, only recently uh, they added to it the walls around, surrounding it, which gave to it some kind of monumental aspect. And uh, above the main entrance, they added, uh, they added a date which said that the cemetery at that moment was 500 years old. And then he says that there were a few hundred uh, gravestones and that amongst them, that many of them were very old and that they were disintegrating and that the time ate the inscriptions and that between the hundreds of those there was uh, two graves next to each other uh, in the shape of the Latin or Cyrillic letter T. Uh, one of them was facing east, and that was uh, Nathan's grave, uh, and the other one was the grave of his shamash, or of his, uh, how would you call it, servant, helper, butler, <laughs> wallet, uh, and the Jews, that's what he says, the Jews of Skopje 
know very well about these graves and there are many legends and one of them says the following one Friday morning many many years ago uh, um, very early in the morning a man appeared in uh, Skopje he went uh, he was looking for Jewish cemetery and he never told to anybody who he was he just told them that my shamash uh, will come three days after these were uh, his last words he told from him you will learn who I am then he went to the cemetery and he made his own grave he lied in it and he died and three days later his shamash arrived and he told everybody uh, that he is the shamash of the great and learned Rabbi Nathan the Jews erected a, a monument or, or a matzeba and this is the inscription and it's quoted every place so this is something that everybody knows Bet Moed Lechol Chai and so on uh, and here is a Serbian translation and interestingly enough he says uh, that every Tisha Be'av Jews of Skopje used to do Hilula for Ribi Natan we will have we will have a different uh, we will have a different uh, testimony from a different person uh, it's a bit strange and I am led to believe that he uh, he knew uh, about Shabtai Tzvi and Tisha Be'av and he took it from there to Natan but Natan uh, his Hilula is not on Tisha Be'av his Hilula as you can see from uh, the Hebrew inscription on the grave is on the 11th of Shevat 11th of Shevat this is the picture uh, of the grave and you can actually see that it is not really in the middle of other graves so this is something very confusing as we saw uh, it doesn't really matter whether you are a Polish writer or a Serbian writer or a German born uh, Israeli researcher but you can't write about these matters without a thousand pages and then uh, whenever you turn to two different sources everybody is saying something different so this guy is bringing he himself is bringing the picture and in the picture what you see is that the grave is not really in the middle of other graves but in, this, in his own description he says between in the middle between uh, other graves we see the grave of Rabbi Nathan so we don't really know uh, how remote it were other Jewish graves from his one uh, but we do know that it was within the uh, walls of the Jewish cemetery of Skopje so this is another translation just for those of us who don't read Hebrew but do read Serbian this is the translation of the inscription made by the late Jenny Lebel now uh, the Jews of Skopje made this uh, uh, grave a place of Ziara now anybody who knows anything about Sephardic folklore knows that uh, visiting the graves of Sadiqim is very 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 typical for Hasidim and is very very typical for Moroccan Jews whether Sephardim or Toshavim local but Sephardic Jews of the Balkans didn't really have too many places to, too many places to make ziyarat to so in entire this area of Yugoslavia basically there is one grave of Ribi Moshe Danon which is in Stolac which was visited uh, yearly by the Jews of Sarajevo and he was considered to be a Kabbalist a future uh, a prophet basically a person who saw the future and could foretell the future and so on another one is here in Skopje and interestingly enough it was not visited necessarily by the Sabbatians unlike for example the uh, what was supposed to be the grave of Shabtai Tzvi in Ulcin which was visited regularly by the Nume community or by the Ma'aminim we should rather say by the Ma'aminim community from Salonika and we have uh, testimonies about that from German press the grave in Skopje was visited by local Jews on different occasions first of all on the day of his Petira on the day of his Yorzeit which is 11th of Shabbat and then it depended largely on what were your problems but 
ladies who had pro uh, any general sorrow, people would run to his grave. Any any community problem, people would run to his grave. And in addition to that, also it was considered to be um, very helpful for ladies who can't give birth to children. So they used to come from all over Macedonia and basically from all over the Balkans to Rabbi Nathan's uh, grave. And this is one of the first, this is Jenny Label saying, and I don't know what is her uh, source, but she says that people used to put stones onto his grave, which would be probably the first mentioning of such a custom amongst the Sephardim. This is uh, a custom that developed amongst the Ashkenazim of putting a stone on the grave and it was very, very late, uh, lately it came amongst the Sephardim. Now, we have another uh, testimony about uh, customs and legends of Jews of Skopje related to the grave of uh, Rabbi Nathan, uh, written in Hebrew by Ezra Hamenachem. He is one of the modern Hebrew writers, born in Skopje in 1907. His family left for Israel before the First World War, which basically means that he was five, six years old when they left Skopje. However, though Skopje and Macedonia and Balkans are strongly reflected uh, in all his stories. Um, however, though not necessarily always uh, the stories are based on these cities themselves, but rather many a time on people coming from these cities and living in the old city of Jerusalem. So many a time he tells the story about the Jews from Skopje in Jerusalem, the Jews from Pitala in Jerusalem, the Jews from Sarajevo in Jerusalem. But together with that, he writes also the legends of the Jews of Skopje. So here I'm uh, throwing this piece of information because somebody should translate that into Macedonian certainly. Okay, now, before, before we get to him, I would like us to concentrate on a source that was already treated by Kershaw Sholem, so basically all the scholars uh, most certainly know about it. This is the famous Ham Ribi Chaim Palachi, his book uh, Kola Haim, uh, in which he says the following. Okay. Veshamati Mipi Beni Hagadol, Rave Atsum, Abraham, Rehima, and so on. I'll translate straight uh, to English. He says, and I've heard from the mouth of my son, uh, 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 Rabbi Abraham, uh, this ter terrible story, how Rabbi Shabetai Ventura went to Skopje, and there is a custom of Jews of the, Jew, of the local Jews, that being the fact that the cemetery is outside of the city and that the way from the city goes by the cemetery, the custom was that any person leaving the city should go and say hi to the tzaddikim. And then he can leave safely. So the story says, Rabbi Chaim Palachi brings it, how Rabbi Shabetai Ventura, now we know who Rabbi Shabetai Ventura is, he's a famous Kabbalist, he is the pupil of Radaf, Ribi David Benyakov Pardo uh, from Sarajevo, and he wrote uh, a Kabbalistic work, uh, Nehar Shalom. He was a rabbi in uh, Spalato, or modern day Split. And the story says uh, he came and they told him, uh, well, before you leave the city, maybe you should pay uh, respect to the uh, uh, grave of the Tzaddik. Now, he was not considered to be a Maimonidian. He was not considered to be a rationalist who usually doesn't do so. His reaction to the offer is basically related to the fact that this is Nathan's grave. Generally, Rabbi Shabita Ventura doesn't have a problem. It's not an ideological problem. He doesn't have a problem of visiting the, the graves of saints because he, as a Kabbalist, he believes in those things. However, though, he asks who is the guy and they tell him uh, Nathan of Gaza and he says, oh, not needed. And he does like this and uh, his, uh, his hand became leprous in the moment and then he had, that he ha then he had to uh, 
turn to, the, to come to the grave and to ask for forgiveness and so on. Now, this motif is a very known motif. This subject is a very known subject. What is interesting here are three things. First thing is that we are given exact names, because usually these are legends in which you are given, you are given only the name of the tzaddik. A man came, a man said, oh, who cares? His hand was uh, taken or whatever, was paralyzed, and then he prayed and everything is good. But here we have uh, one Chacham giving the name of another Chacham who was very cherished and very honored Chacham amongst the Sephardim at the time. And so from that moment on, uh, Rabbi Shabetai Ventura decided that every day he will read 18 Psalms Le'ilui Nishmat for the uprisal of the soul of uh, Nathan of Gaza and many a time, that's what the book says here, that the text says here, sometimes when, when the day was coming to its end and he realized that he didn't say those uh, 18 Psalms, he would be upset. He felt that's something he needs to, you know, to deal with, to do. But then later, his son, Abraham, came to Skopje, and when they passed the cemetery, he died. That's the story brought in uh, Chaim Palachi. Now, interestingly enough, from the mom uh, and this is something that's very known, from the moment that uh, Rabbi Yaakov and then uh, ascribed the book Hemdat Yamim to Nathan of Gaza, the Ashkenazim had reservations about the book and so basically that means that most of the people accepted his uh, ascription. Ashkenazim had a problem with that so they mostly uh, had reservations with the book because they believed it was written by Nathan and the Sephardim believed that it was written by Nathan and they proceeded reading the book as if it was written by any other regular Sephardic Chacham. So what Rabbi Palachi does he, is he doesn't even call the grave the grave of Rabbi Natan, he calls it the grave of Hemdat Yamim, the grave of the author of Hemdat Yamim. That was mis, um, misnomination, let's, let us call it. Okay, now this is the translation into Serbian done by Jenny Level again for all those who didn't read the entire story in Hebrew. Now, this is Ezra Hamenachem, and who, I have it all in PDF, so whoever needs to uh, read the entire story, obviously we can't uh, do it together, but uh, there is a beautiful description of the Jewish uh, uh, quarter in Skopje, and of the Jewish life in Skopje, and so on. So the name of the book, uh, of the collection of stories, is Betzel Yamim, and the name of the story that uh, I want us to consult for briefly is Hilula de Rav Natan. And uh, here you can see the beautiful description of the, I mean, to, to my mind it's beautiful, description of the, Jew, of the Jewish quarter in Skopje. And here he says that the Jews of Skopje, uh, they have another strange belief. <laughs> Uh, which is the inheritance of the Jews of this small city uh, in their ancient cemetery, uh, which is outside in the Gentile realm. In other words, he's saying it's not next to the Jewish quarter, but rather next to the Christian village. That this is also shows us to what extent Jews were comfortable, more comfortable in the city than uh, going to villages next to it. Um, and Samufle Beta Metivot, which means next to the railway station. Metrim Shnei there are two graves over there, uh, of one rabbi and of his sexton. Uh, they are all, these graves are very old, they are older than 200 years, and uh, the Jews of Skopje received tradition from the fathers of their fathers that these two are great uh, tzaddikim. Um, and interestingly enough, Ezra Hamenachem converts even the sexton uh, into a miracle worker and great tzaddik. So it's not only uh, Rabbi Nathan, but also, uh, but also his sexton. Um, every year on the day of 11, of, on the 11th day of the month 
Shabbat, in the middle of the snow season, the Jews of Skopje are making Hilula on their graves, and this Hilula is known as Hilula Derav Natan. Okay, and then here is a description. Uh, so we can see basically that both Jacques Confino and uh, Ezra Hamenachem, one writing in Serbian and another writing in Hebrew, they are basically both collecting local legends. And there is a local legend how uh, Nathan of Gaza came to Skopje and he told the local uh, rabbi, he told him, um, I, came, I came to die in your city because I want to be buried in Jewish cemetery. So this legend also discloses the dialogue or imagined dialogue between the local rabbi and uh, Nathan of Gaza. Now, the story develops, and this is very, this is very interesting. Here we have, here we have um, Hebrew, Jewish Hebrew writer who reflects on beliefs of his own community after moving to Jerusalem. The Jews of Skopje considered Nathan of Gaza to be uh, the best amongst the tzaddikim <laughs> buried in their graveyard, and they really considered this to be spiritual capital, connection to heaven, and place to pray. And they didn't have any remorse about that, they didn't have any reservations about that, and uh, most of the time, most of the people were not even aware of the fact that other Jews in other places might have certain reservations about the man and everything he stands for or stood for. So what happens is, Ezra HaMenachem from Skopje comes to Jerusalem and he's telling everybody in Jerusalem the story about Nathan of Gaza and everybody is telling him, are you crazy? I mean, you know, the guy is the prophet of the false messiah. So he is building this entire story of a rabbi from Salonika. Now this is not a legend anymore, this is basically fiction work. But in his fiction work you can basically see that he already internalized reservations of the rest of the Jewish world outside of Skopje towards Nathan of Gaza. So the story, to make the long story short, the story is the new rabbi, a very learned one, uh, is offered a job uh, in a better place and the Rosh of Yeshivat Saloniki, the head of the Rabbinic Academy of Salonika, tells him why should you go to the place where there is already a lot of, a lot of Torah? You should rather go to the place where there, is no, uh, where there is no Torah and you should teach them. And then this great rabbi comes to Skopje, which was a sm small community. Uh, basically the big center was Salonika, then Monastir, and Skopje was not considered to be a center of rabbinical learning. So this rabbi comes here, and then there is the meeting of the community board. And in the meeting of the community board, they tell him, well, 11th of Shabbat is approaching and we are having Hirula of Rabbi Nathan. Okay? Um, so, this is, this is what the, the story says. Rabotai, minhag zeshe vekubal be'aratenu midorot, be'ayaratenu midorot, miteva advarim she'ekuyam gam bedorenu uvdorot abaim, and so on. This is the speech of one of the local uh, then the rabbi who came uh, from Salonika obviously has his reservations and he says right there are people who have their reservations concerning those people that are considered by you to be tzadikim there are people who believe that People who are buried there are not what you believe them to be. Nevi'e sheker asher olihu sholal et bet Israel, but rather they are prophets of uh, falsehood or false prophets, uh, which which olihu um, sholal. How would you say? Yeah, which deceived many in the people of uh, Israel. Um, then the rabbi concludes and he says umin hadin shegam kehal kadosh skopje yifkah enav veiten elibo et haemet leamita and it's about time for the holy community of skopje 
to uh, open their eyes and to see the truth the way it is. And then the local sage responds and says, Shemotele igiu afigiu leosnen. These rumors have reached our own ears. Also, uh, that's what Chacham Mushon says. Ribi yom tov u shegila oznenu al adavar beshuvo mimasotav al peneh atfutzot lifnei shalim mispar. Rabbi Yom Tov, uh, the one who traveled a lot, uh, is the one who brought this to our attention uh, when he returned from one of his many trips. Uh, then the rabbi from Salonika tells them, Otama muhzakim beenenu No, sorry, this is still the rabbi from Skopje. Otama muhzakim beenenu tzadikim hayush luchim shel Mashiach Sheker Shoptai Tzvi. So we do know that those people who are seen and recognized by our community as uh, uh, righteous people, they were basically the prophets of Shabbat Tzvi. Hem Natan Ha'azati U Mesham And these are uh, Nathan of Gaza and his sexton. Then the rabbi asks them, Halahem Tizkedu? Are you, will you worship them? Will you bow to them? Rabotai, Atem Ba'e Kohoshel Kehal Kadosh Sefaradim Be'ir Skopje. Will you, the representatives of the holy community of Skopje, do such a thing to bow in front of uh, these prophets? And then the local rabbi tells him, tells to the rabbi from Salonika, I'm waiting for your decision. Rabbi, our rabbi. Uh, um, I will not speak to the community until you tell me that the rabbi of the community will go in front of the community to pay respect to this uh, ancient custom. Um, then the rabbi is asking himself whether he should uh, whether he should uh, Klum alai le asheru kayem ze ha minhag sheen meshalo be Israel minhag shel kefira bederech toim ve kazav sheva emuna. Will I give strength to this strange custom which is based on heresy and uh, so on? And then uh, they tell him the story how Nathan of Gaza came and how basically, and this is. This is uh, interesting. When Nathan of Gaza came, there was a let, there was death, uh, there was black death, attack of uh, black death in Skopje, and Jews were protected uh, by his. Actually, the the very fact that he died and was buried there was what stopped the uh, Magifa from crossing. The Vardar. Okay, you will see uh, today in the afternoon where the Jewish Museum or where the Holocaust Museum is located, uh, and that is exactly the place where the Jewish uh, where the Jewish quarter was. And they were afraid that the disease will reach them, and it didn't. And they immediately recognized that this is because this great strange rabbi was buried there. And. Um, Finally, the entire community, uh, the entire community comes to uh, on the 11th of Shabbat. They are all coming there. The rabbi is not there, so they they proceed with their costume. And interestingly enough, once they are finished, and here we have also um, the description of uh, what they what how they used to. Uh, there is also the tradition of the name. Of the local rabbi who met with uh, Nathan of Gaza, uh, and he is called Ribi Ovadia Kalmaro. And uh, here is also a description uh, of their conversation and how Nathan of Gaza told him, uh, I will read it, Igia Sha'ati Rabenu, my hour has come. Uh, and this is exactly the reason why I came here to stop my wanderings. 
Eh, Amarti avo el zoha iria le maan eshkon bekever Israel. I told myself I will come to this small city. So what's the idea basically? The idea is that if he went to Salonika, his uh, desire of being buried in Jewish cemetery might be uh, prevented by the reaction or, or, or uh, yeah, of local rabbis. So basically what he's doing is he's going to a place where there is a Jewish cemetery but there is no halakhal authority which will prevent other Jews from giving him a Jewish burial in the Jewish cemetery. So basically they are ascribing to him um, that he did this on purpose. He came to Skopje precisely because this is a small community where they will let him uh, be buried uh, in the Jewish cemetery. And uh, here we also have uh, this description of the, the description of the disease and uh, we also have the description of what Jews of Skopje used to do on the day of the Hilula. Uh, let me just find it, okay. Leaharat filah be'afsiyah hashahar after the morning prayer, uh, immediately after the dawn, uh, they would read certain psalms and they would read passages from Zohar. Uh, then, uh, then they would have, just like usually even today on your site in Sephardic synagogue, they would have huevos caminados and burekas and they would have some arak. Okay. Uh, and this would be served to everybody. Uh, uh, and then at the dawn the entire community would go to the graveyard to pray and to, yeah, on the grave of uh, Nathan ben Elisha okay so to make the long story short we can see yeah I know I'm finishing we know we see that basically um, the Nathan of Gaza was considered to be uh, a saint by the Jews of Macedonia. There is no doubt about that. But we also see, we also see that from very fact that he never converted to Islam, unlike Shabtai Tzvi, he was much less, much less controversial than, uh, in, than, for example, he would be perceived in an Ashkenazi community, in an Ashkenazi setting. We also, we also know the famous sentence by the same Rabbi Falachi, who said we were told by our rabbis not to speak about Shabtai Tzvi at all, not for good and not for bad. So even about Shabtai Tzvi, they wouldn't say anything. And Nathan of Gaza, not only the Jews of Macedonia cherished him as their own, their own local saint, but also all of the Sephardic rabbis on all of the Balkans wrongly assumed and wrongly believed that the book Hebdat Hayamim was written by him and this didn't prevent this book from becoming one of the most cherished halakhal works in the Balkans. So, we be, then we can ask ourselves why does Ezra HaMenachem is so apologetical about all of this and why does he has to introduce into his fiction work entire this quarrel between Salonika and Skopje, when we know that even in Salonika everybody is reading Hebdat Yamin. So my conclusion is that Ezra HaMenachem ascribes to Salonika what he basically, these are not the original Salonikan uh, feelings uh, necessary towards uh, Nathan, rather it seems to be that this was atmosphere of Jerusalem, where there is this uh, Ashkenazi approach to Nathan of Gaza, and then he, being from Skopje, all of a sudden feels that he needs to explain. And instead of making it discussion between Ashkenazi and Sephardic sources, he converts it into uh, discussion between the center, like Salonika, and periphery, like Skopje. But I don't believe it reflects historical truth. I do believe that... I, what does that mean, I do believe? We can see that the book, Hemdat Hayamim, was considered by, there was a consensus amongst the Sephardic rabbis that this was written by Nathan and nobody had a problem with quoting it. So, however though, and this is a bit confusing, we do see that both authors, 
Ezra HaMenachem, who needs to be apologetical because of uh, being exposed to different traditions in Jerusalem, and Jacques Confino also bring legends which are, which are telling that Nathan picked Skopje as a small community uh, in order to be, uh, to be buried in Jewish cemetery, which means that even the, the, the uh, legend told by the Jews of Skopje is already apologetical. Okay, and now this is my final conclusion. We don't know how old this legend is. So it might also reflect the new approach of the Jews of Skopje, who at the same time when Ezra HaMenachem is exposed to anti nathans feelings in Jerusalem, Jews of Skopje are probably exposed to anti natanical feelings uh, here, and this is when this legend is not, probably not made, but just changed. So we don't have earlier versions of this legend, uh, but that's the way I think things work. That's more or less what I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> we have five minutes for questions, comments, please. Yes, uh, fascinating material. A uh, question, is there any information if those legends broke the small circle of uh, if you have information, because it is very, very rare and very different from the mainstream in, uh, in Judaism, or even in the Sardis in the broad sense, I will talk about a, a rabbi from Baghdad, and he thought exactly the opposite. And the other comment is very associative. Uh, the name of this uh, uh, rabbi from Salonika, Mushon, in the Sephardic uh, tradition, it's a comic name. It's, uh, it's parallel to Joha. It's like, uh, and all the other names of the rabbis are um, important names. So Rabbi Be, son of this, kind of that. So maybe this was also an, a, a kind of comment of Ibrahim Menachem, who of course was in the side of uh, Rabbi Nathan, to mock a little uh, that rabbi from Salonika. Well, but it's... it's association. Uh, no, you are right, but I didn't have time yes. for that, but ah, you, you are right and you are wrong. Let me put it this way. Rabbi Moshon is from here. Yes. And that's what the, the very fact that they don't, that don't call him Hacham Moshe, that they call him Moshon, which is diminutive, that means that he's not really a great rabbi, but he's just Talmud Chachamim, more learned than the, than the rest of the Jews of Skopje, but still somebody that we call in diminutive form. Because when you say Moshon, it's, 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 it's basically, it's not Rebbe Moshe. Rebbe Moshe is son of... And at the same time, look at the name of the rabbi from Salonika. He's called Rebbe Yaakov, Be Rebbe Yitzchak El Nekave. Mm -hmm. So, Ezra HaMenachem is basically saying that the learned rabbi from Salonika, who is the son of the rabbi, and who also has the name of El Nekave, who wrote Menorat Maor, one of the most famous mm -hmm. Uh, late Sephardic Midrashim. Uh, so, to him he ascribes this position of uh, are you crazy? These people are heretics. And then, local rabbi from Skopje, uh, Rabbi, rabbi Moshon, he is, oh no, this is the tradition from our fathers, we have to keep it. However, though, maybe I didn't say uh, the story ends with Jews doing whatever they are used to do and then rabbi joins them, after they already did the uh, Hilula, the rabbi from Salonika joins them because I mean, otherwise it wouldn't be a Sephardic story. Uh, uh, yes, Sephardic rabbis are never presented uh, in, 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 in these stories as people who run against their community or people who fight against the community. They might have their reservations, but finally they, you know, they go along. It's, there is a saying, uh, it's better for Israel to be uh, making unbilling sins than to be making billing sins. So if you know that they will make sin, uh, you just let them, but you don't tell them this is a sin, because then they will do it anyway, <laughs> and then this will be a willing sin. So it's, it's interesting, it's interesting that uh, the rabbi, which is against, he is... He is the important. He, yeah. And the local rabbi is Musho. Okay. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much, it's fascinating. The is a strange offer. He wrote extensively about Kabbalists in Jerusalem and also about the Ashkenazi Kabbalists who went to the, to the Ten Lost Tribes. And uh, one of the heroes of one of his stories is Menachem Melchin Halkari. This is 
not, it's very important because he wrote a small booklet called Kvot Chachamim to defend the study in Sefer Chandat Yavim. And he also believed that he is Matana Azadi. And so there is a kind of debate between 1913 and 1927 in Jerusalem about Chandat Yamin. Not between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim, but within the Ashkenazic Kabbalistic Yeshivot. Mm-hmm. So it's very important because he knew it very well, and this story is also reflecting the debate in Jerusalem at the same time. Well, that, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. It, it, it doesn't reflect anything local. It reflects, it reflects Jerusalem. Yes, but it's not like Jerusalem, the people are Ashkenazic and they don't read Chandat Yamin. Specifically in Jerusalem, Chandat Yamin was a very popular book among all Kabbalists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some more questions, comments? Do we know why he died? Do we know why he died? Because he was very young when he did. Well, legends don't say anything about that. So this is... Uh, but typical to the legends that uh, Kadosh, a holy man, knows ahead of time that he is going to die. Mm-hmm. Like a gentle, like, uh, like my body did. So he knew, and this is part of the uh, geographical legend, he knew ahead of time that he was going to die. I, I'll just add one, something to that. Uh, both places which are reverberated which are, rev- rev- how do you call it, rev- revered in the Balkans, uh, follow, follow the same model. The Rabbi Moshe Danon from Sarajevo, he leaves for the land of Israel, uh, he leaves Sarajevo, he's on his way next to Mostar in the city of Stolets, he passes, this is uh, the legend of Avshalom, he passes under the tree, so it's not his hair that gets cut into the tree, but it's the tree that removes his face. And from this he learns that he is about to die. So he gets off his uh, horse and uh, uh, he, he starts reading from Zohar and he waits for his own death. And then he dies and then his Shamash, who was with him, buries him. And interestingly enough, in both cases, the rabbi and the sexton are buried next to each other. Both rabbis are told to know that they are about to die. And for Nathan, they even say that he dig his own grave, lied into it, and died. While for the rabbi from Sarajevo, they only say he was reading Zohar, waiting for the dead, and then in a few hours he just died, and his sexton uh, did the job. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Tamara Alexander. She is Professor Emerita from the Department of Hebrew Literature from Bangalore University, the Shirley Girl. She was, she is a physician, she is chairperson of the National Authority for Radio Culture, head of the Interdisciplinary Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the College, and member of the Committee of Society. of conferences about one and the year. She is co-editor and founder of academic journals, Jerusalem Studies in Jewish Folklore.